Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Faith Bagley and I'm the program associate for the Oral History Association. I just want to thank John Fenn and Andy Kolovis for putting together this great presentation. And I also want to thank the American Folklore Society for partnering with us to put this webinar together. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to quickly introduce you all to this platform. Please introduce yourself in the chat box. We would love to know where you are listening from. And you can also use the chat box to ask any questions that you have during the presentation. Um, also during the webinar, you have the option to make the PowerPoint full screen. You'll just need to click the four outward facing arrows at the top right corner of the presentation box. You can click those arrows again to exit the full screen mode. Just know that you will not be able to see the chat box when the presentation is full screen. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to John and Andy. Thank you. Hey, I've lost everyone's audio. You hear me, buddy? Andy, can you hear me? Yes, I can, John. Um, hold on, something's gone wrong. I can't hear anything, Andy. Jessica Turner is joining the crowd. Um, this is super weird because I can't hear anything all of a sudden. Let me see if I can. Fix this. I was working at the test. I was working before. Hey, Terry. Hold on. All right, here I go. Hey, I think I got you back now. I got it. All right. Awesome. Sorry. Weird test problem. All right. So we're on, right? We're doing our intro here. Yeah, I guess we are. Okay, cool. Um, well, uh, welcome everyone. Sorry about that little glitch there. This is about digital audio technology, so uh, you know, got to demonstrate our wisdom and madness here. Um, so my name is John Fenn. I'm at the American Folklife Center, the head of research and programs, um, and I'll be co-hosting this webinar today with my colleague Andrew Glovis. You want to give yourself an intro there, Andy? Hi, I'm Andy from the Vermont Folklife Center. Good to see all the names appearing in the chat box. Yeah, it's awesome to see everyone. Um, so uh, we're going to get started here. We're going to go for about an hour um, talking at you mostly. Um, please do feel free to put questions in the chat box for sure. Um, we'll track those. We'll, we'll answer them as need be while they come up, but we'll also hold um, probably some of them till the end to a Q&A session when we can kind of group things together. Um, we recognize we're going to be tossing a bunch of information at you. It's tech on purpose, but we're trying to, as we'll talk about, give you some information to work from um, as you move into your own uh, digital audio recording situations for field work. So um, we're going to go off camera now um, and bring up a slide deck. We'll come back on for the Q&A. Um, it's weird that we can't see anyone else, but Andy and I can see each other at least, so that's comforting. All right, so I'm going to switch us over into the next room here. So you'll start to see a slide deck as soon as it comes up. Um, just like magic. Um, I hope everyone's having a good day or evening or morning across all of the various time zones that I was seeing in here. Um, we're going to talk you through field recording in general a little bit um, because a lot of what we're talking about sort of pertains to analog or digital technologies, but we're assuming everyone's doing digital at this point because analog field recording equipment started to kind of disappear or go out of favor in the early 2000s. Um, so we'll make note of where things are digital specific, but again, the goal is of field recording is to make the best recordings you can with the equipment available to you. Um, we have a few other things that we 
think about, um, especially from an archival perspective. Um, Andy working at the Vermont Folklife Center as an archivist and me working at the Library of Congress now. Um, you're creating recordings that you intend to save for yourselves or for others in the future. You have a responsibility to use the best quality equipment you can and to know how to use it well. So we're going to we're going to get into some some knowledge and information about the equipment itself rather than how to use it. But we'll talk about both a little bit. Primary objective today is to provide knowledge about digital audio technology, useful or used in field work, to help you make informed decisions, either about the gear you already have or gear you're looking to acquire or a setup you're looking to borrow. So we're trying to give you some information here that's portable across a bunch of situations. Um, we figured we'd start by letting everyone know a little bit about how we came to have the, the information and vague skills that we have. Um, in order to somewhat demystify the idea that tech is only uh, the, the purview of certain kinds of people or certain training. Um, I started my adventure with audio recording using a, a multi-track um, cassette recorder in my first year of college making songs with my roommate that introduced me to microphones and all the mistakes you can make and how to think about recording media. Um, and then uh, fast forward to grad school where there wasn't a lot of tech training in my graduate program in folklore, but I was really interested in field recording. So I started getting to handle professional cassette recorders for field work, the Sony and Marantz. Um, started working on some early digital audio just because it was starting to appear and I was interested. Uh, bought myself a, a digital audio tape deck to go to Malawi for a year in 1999 and a microphone. And so that was my real introduction to learning how to use digital audio technology. And all of this was pretty much self-taught at this point. Um, as I went through a, a career in, in, in academia, um, I was teaching a lot of field work, continuing to stay up to date on the latest digital audio technology so, so I could turn around and teach students and sometimes my colleagues about this. Andy and I ran some workshops together. Um, and now I'm in a position where the staff that I work with and myself, we are often called on to give recommendations to people to give pointers, tech tips. I've continued to learn all of this stuff on my own by consulting a bunch of different sources. Um, and what we're trying to do here is give you some of the information that we've learned in order to, to help you know more about digital audio technology. So Andy, you want to give your tale while I pull up the rest of this slide? Yeah, so my story is not that different from John's. We were both in the same graduate program and I, you know, we learned very little there about the specifics of how to use this equipment. Like I think about one of my first class projects that involved an interview and I was using a boom box set up to record. Um, you know, so I learned most of the stuff I know, well, everything I know on the job. Um, you know, so I was at graduate school in folklore and also as, as a, a library school student studying archives. And it was in archive school that I began to learn a bit about archival audio and audio preservation. Uh, and then I arrived in Vermont in 2002 and quickly was told that as the archivist, it was my responsibility to maintain the equipment and teach people how to use it, which uh, curiously in, in the world of folklore archives is not uncommon. I learned that later too. So I had to pretty much figure out on my own, uh, starting with Marantz and Sony cassette decks and then moving through DAT and mini disc, and then ultimately to compact flash and other solid state memory recorders, how to use these things. Um, all the different properties they have, the pluses and minuses. I started maintaining uh, an online resource about audio recording equipment aimed at uh, ethnographers and oral historians. Uh, and, you know, that was, you know, I learned all this on the job. Uh, so, it, 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 as I've said, if I can figure it out, anybody can. Um, one of the points that we want to make, too, is that this presentation has a certain amount of detail in it. Um, you're going to get a copy of the PowerPoint um, at the end, if you like it, by email, as well as some other handouts that address uh, different kinds of topics. So we're going to pass over some of this stuff maybe quicker than you might like in the context of a, of a workshop, but you're going to have all the information um, to reflect on later. So we're going to give you an introduction, and if you want to dive deeper, it'll be there. Okay, John. And I'll just add that our contact information will be on the slide deck as well, so you'll be able to get a hold of us um, should that be necessary. Uh, what we have up here now is just an, kind of an overview and a roadmap of what we're going to go through um, in the remaining time we have with you. Um, noting that technology and terminology and concepts are going to be sprinkled throughout this webinar. We'll certainly stop and pause and reflect and unpack some of the ones that are that we feel are really important. Um, but, but it will be throughout and we'll keep returning to some of these ideas too. 
um, we're going to follow the signal chain is the way we're going to walk through technology um, and we're going to define what signal chain means and give you some some illustrations of that as well so that's how we're going to talk about the equipment we're also going to talk about need versus want and what those terms mean when you're when you're assembling your field recording setup or trying to get more proficient with the gear you have um, in, the form, in the form of some questions and some concepts to think about. And then finally, we're going to focus on something really big that you need in the digital world, which is a preservation plan. Um, and that Andy's going to walk us through that um, at the, in the last quarter of, of the, the webinar today. So a signal chain. Um, some of you may be familiar with this term. Um, it appears in all forms of discussions of audio recording, whether it's highfalutin studio-based um, records or field recording. Um, it's basically the, the path from your sound source to your recording media. And so this, this wonderful animated illustration uh, done by my talented colleague, Andrew Kolovas, is, uh, is gonna walk us through this. So you get a microphone, the beginning of the signal chain. Uh, the cable is an important part. A mic stand is, you know, a form of technology for sure. Um, goes into the audio recorder and then goes to the headphones. So that's sort of a basic breakdown of what we mean when we say signal chain. There's some other components to the signal chain too, though. We're, we're going to get a little, little deeper into it here. Um, so within that audio recording device which we've laid out here sometimes that's the, a black box for people in technological terms we don't know what happened inside of it having some of these ideas um, broken out for us makes us helps us understand what's going on when we're doing field recording especially digital field recording so here we have we have our microphone um, we have a sound source right that could be an interview could be a performance event it could be a whatever just happened in the background there a thwack um, so the, the the arrow is pointing goes into your microphone um, within your microphone, and we're going to get to microphones in a little bit more detail here um, when, when Andrew takes over, there's a, a weak electrical signal is generated. Um, that signal goes through an XLR cable, and we'll define XLR a little bit or identify XLR a little bit more visually for you in a second here. Goes, it's weak though, it's a very small signal. It goes through what's called a microphone preamplifier, another term we're going to return to in a minute. So you see this is all within your re recording device. A stronger signal comes out of the microphone preamplifier. This goes in, this is where we start to get digital. Up until this point, everything's analog. Goes into what's called an AD converter chip. An analog to digital conversion happens where you have an analog signal going in and then out of that you have basically strings of zeros and ones. Goes through some various circuitry depending on the kind of digital audio device you're dealing with, and we'll break some of those options down a little bit here. Then it goes out to either a headphone amp or circuit and your recording media. So this is kind of an elaborated inside the box view of what happens um, based on our limited understanding that we've generated over the years. So, so the signal chain, we're gonna again talk about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into the two pieces right now, the microphone preamp and the AD converter chip so we know what Kind of terminology and and numbers and, and factors that um, often get grouped into the notion of quality how do you have qu high quality audio field recordings which are if we go back to one of our first slides part of the responsibility we have as cultural documentarians oral historians folklorists ethnomusicologists people making field recordings to document traditional culture folk life all sorts of, of, of elements of, of people's lived experience and artistic practice so preamp is often a term is a term that gets bandied around a bunch. Yeah, you, know, you need a good pre, you need a good preamp to get a good sound, and that's true. Um, but what does a preamp do? As we said, it takes a weak electrical signal generated in the, in the mechanics and, and, and technology of the microphone, and it turns it into a stronger signal that can be written to your recording media. Back in the old days, it was analog tape or even instantaneous discs in, in the 30s and 40s. But now it's it's some sort of digital media, right? So microphone preamp. It's a circuit that boosts the incoming signal. Everything that can make a recording has a microphone preamp. You might not always be able to see it. You might not always be able to control all the features or elements of it, but it's in there. So it's part of the circuitry inside of an audio recording device. 
not all mic pre's are created equal and this is where we start to get into some of the some of the differences around um, notions of quality a low quality an inexpensive mic preamp will add noise while boosting the signal so yeah if you have a mic pre that adds a lot of whistling humming white noise that's probably a lower quality pre so yeah it's making the the interviewee's voice louder on your signal but it's also adding the noise that's inherent in a lot of electronic circuit um, circuitry. High quality mic pre will boost the signal but adds minimal noise. You don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money to get a high quality mic pre, but you do have to know that that's something that's going to be important in understanding how you're evaluating the gear. Again, you might borrow or buy. So mic pre is something important here. Um, Keep in mind that even going through the mic pre, everything's still analog. Um, in order for the digital audio recorder to capture the electrical audio signal that you've generated through your microphone and your mic pre, it has to go through this transition that's called analog to digital conversion. Okay, so it turns your analog signal into a digital data stream. That happens in another piece of circuitry, if you remember that, that illustration we had called the AD converter. So there you get the, the signal coming out of the mic pre, goes into an AD converter, comes out as a bunch of zeros and ones. Binary data is the computer terminology there. Um, we think of it as a digital audio stream or a signal. Those terms are somewhat interchangeable. Um, all digital audio recorders, including computer sound cards, um, uh, smartphones, they all have AD converters built into their, their um, audio path. Um, Understanding what these do kind of gives us some sense of, of how to think about digital audio as computer data. Um, there are, and there are two elements of, of this computer data stream for us to understand. There's a bunch more elements built into the math and science of it, but, but these are terms that you're going to run into as you're thinking about and, and experiencing digital audio. I um, mean, you might be familiar with some of them, but we're going to break them down. We have sampling rate, and then we have bit depth. Together, these two um, terms and concepts uh, are thought about as the, the quality of a digital audio file, and they have numbers associated with them that you might have seen before, and we're going to just explain it a little bit more. So, but first we're going to talk about what, what the sampling rate is. So an analog audio signal is a continuous signal, right? As we hear things out in the world, natural sounds, human-made sounds, we, we, we hear them as continuous um, sort of phenomena. When it goes to the AD converter, that converter chops that continuous phenomena up into samples, tiny little slices. Um, and Andy, you had a metaphor yesterday for understanding this. Do you want to relay that to everyone? Yeah, sure. You know, so think about motion picture film. Um, so you know, if you move your arm in front of your face, you're moving your arm in front of your face, right? You see it moving. If you point a film camera on it, every couple instances, it's taking an individual snapshot of the position of your hand as you're moving it across. Uh, space. So what a sample, what sampling does essentially metaphorically is it takes a picture of each incoming of the waveform of the analog waveform um, each a certain number of times per second uh, to document what it looks like. So it's, it's, it's akin to the idea of motion picture film. It's not the thing, it's a series of pictures of the thing that when strung together and played back at a certain speed sounds whole. So CD quality audio is a, a you know, consumer market-driven standard that those of us who listen to music a lot have, have become familiar with. It's, it's um, the quality of audio we hear in a CD is akin to what we might hear live in front of us is what the conceit is. For any second of CD quality audio, there's 44,100 samples that represent that second. So we're gonna get into some math here, but just, so that's often represented as 44.1 kilohertz. Um, if you've seen that in, in, in digital audio technology or, or manuals of your gear, it can sample it, it can record at 44.1 kilohertz. That's what they're talking about. For each second of audio, it's making 44,100 of these tiny pictures or these samples. So that, that's sampling rates measured in kilohertz. In very practical terms, sampling rate lets us or helps determine the sound frequencies that can be represented in the digital domain in digital audio and there's something called the nyquist theorem 
um, that I know is a favorite of Thomas Grant Richardson's, and I know he's on here, so this is for you, Thomas. Um, and this has to do with the physics of hearing. So human ears can hear up to about 22.5 kilohertz as, as the highest frequency we can we can sort of recognize in our sort of perceptual apparatus of our ears and brain. Um, the Nyquist theorem says that in order to represent that, that frequency range in digital audio, you have to sample twice as much. So you see that 22.5, if you multiply that by two, that comes out to be 44.1 kilohertz. So that's where that number comes from. Sampling above 44.1 kilohertz, um, other sampling rates that are common are 48 kilohertz, which is common in digital video, uh, 96 kilohertz up to 128 kilohertz. Those are mathematically related to each other. Um, and they, they sample frequencies that are technically higher than the human ear, but they're thought about as overtones. I mean, we can get into the physics of this, but it's not so important right now. It's just important to understand that that sampling rate is key to helping determine the, 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 the highest frequency we can sample and then the lowest one as well. And one thing I'll add the is component. That, oh, sorry, John. Is that that sampling rate is like that uh, 22.5 hertz is like super super high like most adults can't hear that it's super high it's like dog hearing uh just as a comparison yeah it's, and it's at the very edge of what human ears can recognize in when but not usually not on its own it's usually a harmonic relationship to other fundamental tones we can hear um the other component that we talked about is bit depth so we have sampling rate um, which is measured in kilohertz and it's related to the sound frequency range that digital audio can capture. The other um, common concept is bit depth, or the other important concept, I should say. This is also called word length, um, and that's a computer programming term. It refers to the number of digits that comprise each individual sample. So you see here, CD quality sound is 44.1 kilohertz at 16 bits. So that's the bit depth for CD quality. Each of the 44,100 snapshots is represented by a string of 16 numbers, 16 bits. So those are going to be ones and zeros because it's computer data. So you stack 44,100 groupings of these 16 digit, digit combinations and you get one second of CD quality audio. Um, so you see there's a lot of math and science in here. That's about as in depth as we're going to get with it and that's about the limit of our understanding. Um, but <laughs> It's important when you start to think about the digital audio gear that you're able to work with, you have access to, that you're using. So sampling rate is about frequency. Bit depth is about dynamic range that can be represented in a digital audio system. The easiest way to understand dynamic range is that ratio between the quietest and the loudest signal present in an audio event. Um, in interviews, that dynamic range is usually not huge. In musical performances, it's usually a little bit broader. Um, in recordings of events, festivals, rituals, outdoor, you know, community events, that dynamic range can be very broad, can be very narrow. Um, imagine, the best way to imagine is you're at an event and, or, or you're recording an interview in someone's room and then someone comes into the room and slams the door. That's going to increase the dynamic range of that audio event for a brief moment because um, there's a really loud sound overwhelming the interview. So dynamic range is, is related to or bit depth is related to the dynamic range that a digital audio um, technology can capture. Bit depth also impacts what we think about as audio fidelity, that how close a digital version sounds to its original analog source. So the longer the digital word, the, the deeper the bit depth, meaning the greater number of digits involved, the, um, the higher the ability of that digital audio stream is to, to replicate what is out there in the natural world. Um, so you see here, just a brief uh, example, 16-bit audio, there's 60, over 65,000 potential combinations of ones and zeros. With 24-bit audio, which is the next step up, um, there's 16 million combinations. So mathematically, there's a logarithmic relationship here going on. Um, bit depth also greatly impacts file size, which is a very practical concern for those of us doing field work. Um, the higher the bit depth, the greater the increase in fi ultimate file size. So you see here a comparison, an hour of stereo CD quality sound, about 600 megabytes. That's what fits essentially on a CD, a little bit more actually. 
um, an hour of stereo at 24 bits, so you could just change the bit depth, but not the sampling rate, is about 900 megabytes. So adds 300 megabytes into that file size. So um, adds up quickly. This has to do, again, with space on your SD cards and your compact flash cards, which we'll get to in a bit, but also adds up with, with storage space after the fact. So sampling rate, bit depth, two key things to understanding what your equipment is capable of and what you're going to end up with on the other side. Um, now, so we have sampling rate and bit depth. Now we can talk about file formats. What are the, the wrappers that go around these audio streams? Um, digital audio is talked about in kind of two flavors, uncompressed and then compressed. So uncompressed file formats such as WAV are the most common that um, we experience with, with uh, digital audio technologies for, for field work. Um, they're basically think of it as the raw format, um, the raw file. Nothing's been thrown out to save space. Compressed file formats such as MP3, which are also a common uh, file format that digital audio recorders can produce, uh, they create smaller files so they save space, but it does so by, by um, throwing away data basically as it's making the file. So your microphone and your preamp is hearing all of the, the full range of frequencies and dynamic range, but when it goes through the AD converter and it's being told to spit out an MP3, it sort of averages between some of those and says, ah, well, the human ear really can't hear some of this stuff anyway, so we're gonna throw out all these bits to make a, a smaller file is what's happening with compressed audio. Um, and we're talking about data compression here, um, not audio compression, which is a different technology entirely. Um, so data compression involves discarding information. It's referred to as lossy. It doesn't, it doesn't improve the quality. Um, we strongly encourage people to record in WAVE, if at all possible. So this is a highly qualified statement. It's not always possible. It's not always feasible and for reasons we'll get into. Um, if you can't do that, you should record in a standard compressed format like MP3 and convert the file to WAVE for long-term storage. Um, that has to do with stabilizing the file rather than improving the quality. So it's important to recognize that if you record an MP3 and then save it as a wave, you're not making it a better recording. You're making the file a little bit more stable in digital preservation terms. Um, Andy, anything to add on that? No, you covered it, man. <laughs> All right. So um, we're gonna, I'm gonna pitch it over to Andy to talk to us about microphones. So we're gonna go back to the top of the signal chain. Um, I'll go back through the chat and see if there's any questions or anything, but um, Andy? Sure, so yeah, we're gonna go back to the top of the signal chain right now and talk about the way we get sound into the recorder uh, via a microphone. Um, and for the sake of this discussion, oh, hang on, that's not doing what I hoped. For the sake of this discussion, we're gonna talk about three aspects of microphones. Um, a lot of which are actually mutually independent, right? So we'll, we'll talk that through as we get to it. The first is the highly technical term form factor, uh, by which I mean what a mic looks like. The second is the fancy way of saying a tran transduction method, but which is a fancy way of saying how the microphone converts uh, the movement of air molecules, vibrating air, sound, into electricity so it can be recorded or even amplified, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. And finally, polar patterns, how a mic picks up sound, um, you know, how, how, uh, how you orient it best to capture the sounds you want to capture. So we're going to start with this idea of form factor. And the first uh, form factor we're going to discuss is this idea of the, of the handheld or stand mount mic. This is the kind of mic most people see, right? Uh, we're most common, you see them in performance, you see them in karaoke, you know, and uh, it's a common mic. This, this style of microphone is real common in field work. You know, that familiar ball on a stick style uh, can be held in a stand or, um, or held in your hand, and it comes in all sorts of different shapes, uh, you know. <clears throat> a second common form factor that we see in field work are uh, what are called lavalier microphones. And these are the small clip-on mics that are often used in video production because they're visually less obtrusive. Uh, you know, so you can put them on someone's shirt and not they don't get picked up on the camera as much as if you have a mic in your face the way I do right now. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we're not talking about relative quality of any of these different forms, just how they look, right? Finally, the third form factor I want to go over is the kind of mics that are built into recorders, uh, which is increasingly common. You know, for the last probably 15 years or more, it's been hard to find 
um, consumer grade and, and, and professional recorders that don't have uh, microphones built into the top that sort of look like this. Uh, what this is a generally what's called an XY array, a pattern of, uh, of uh, lining up the mics with each other. So, um, ooh, I keep doing the wrong thing. So built-in mics are integrated into the recording device. Um, I don't love following this approach or using these because you often have you have to handle the, if you have to handle the recorder in the context of doing an interview, then the handholding noise is going to get picked up by the mic since the mic is attached to the recorder. Also, uh, you know, since you're usually want to place the mic close to the mouth of your interviewee or the speaker or the sound source, you're going to have to keep butzing with it in front of that person. But in a pinch, these are terrific. Um, yeah, and uh, Thomas, we're not going to talk about ribbon mics because those should not leave your studio. Um, so that's form factor. Pretty simple, right? The shapes, the packages, they come in. The next thing we're going to talk about is transduction method, or the way they convert sound that we experience through our ears into electricity so we can capture it. And the first type of mic we're going to talk about is a dynamic microphone. Um, now, dynamic mics use a fixed magnet and a coil of wire attached to a diaphragm. So all the types of, both types of mics we're gonna talk about today have what amounts to a, like a flat piece of plastic called a diaphragm. When sound strikes that diaphragm, and if you could see me right now, you'd see my hand moving back and forth, the diaphragm moves. And in all cases, of all cases of diaphragm-based microphones, they're moving something that's generating electricity. So in a dynamic mic, they move a metal coil that's wrapped around or, you know, a, a magnet, and that fixed magnet and the coil moving through it creates a weak electrical signal that travels down out the microphone, down the cable, and into the recorder. Um, dynamic mics um, are, the, the main virtue of them uh, from a fieldwork perspective is that they require no external power to work. They have that magnet in there, kind of like a super fancy refrigerator magnet. Uh, so they don't need any other added electricity to work with the other parts to generate the electrical audio signal. They're considered very durable, especially relative to other types of mics. Um, they're also, because of the way they work, they can handle loud sound source as well. So, you know, these are the mics that are often used in studios to say, mic a drum kit. Um, the thing is, part of the trade-off is that they're less sensitive than condenser microphones. Uh, and they also are generally lower output. That, that electrical signal they produce is, is uh, weaker, so it will require more adjustment on the recorder side and the mic pre to bring it up to an audible level. Condenser microphones, same basic principle, right? A diaphragm and the motion of the diaphragm creates uh, an electrical signal that's that's analogous, uh, that's where we get the word analog, to the way sound acts in the, in the physical environment. In this case, it's a metallized diaphragm that works in uh, that that works in a magnetic field or an electromagnetic field that's generated by um, a backplate that receives power from another source, right? So there's electricity flowing into the microphone, either from a battery that's in it or from what's called phantom power, which is a power that's supplied by the recorder itself. And that's one of the specs you look for when you're buying a recorder. Can this provide phantom power? Can it provide phantom power at a standard voltage? So the power, the electricity powers that backplate. It generates the field. The metallized diaphragm moves in that field, and the motion of the diaphragm generates the electrical signal that travels down the mic, down the cable, and into the recorder. Condenser mics, as I've said, require external power to work. One of the most frustrating things I do to myself all the time is to forget that and, not, and get stuck trying to figure out why my microphone isn't doing anything until I realize why. Um, the electronics in them, uh, you know, they have more electronics in them and they're considered to be more fragile, uh, you know, uh, in general. Uh, they are more sensitive and this is just a fact of the physics of how they work. They can pick up quieter sound sources more clearly and easily than a dynamic microphone can. And for that reason, they're also considered cleaner sounding. They also are generally higher output. The electrical signal they generate is a stronger one compared to a dynamic microphone. Finally, the third facet we're going to talk about is polar patterns, um, how mics are sensitive to gathering sound. And we're going to talk about four different types of polar patterns that are commonly used in, um, in field recording. And we're going to start with what are called omnidirectional mics. So an omnidirectional mic, and if you see that little diagram there, that's a representation of how a mic is sensitive, with that dot in the middle being where the diaphragm is. 
and I'm just going to drop a mic on there right now so you can see what we're talking about. An omnidirectional mic is a mic that is essentially universally sensitive all around it. It's I, theoretically right talking right into the front of it versus talking into the side versus talking into the back. We'll we'll still record. Uh, we'll still capture that sound equally. In practice, it doesn't really work that way. But generally speaking, they have a very broad sensitivity, which is good for some things and bad for others. If you're recording in very noisy environments, you can't screen out or move the mic around to try to control sound in the way you can with a directional microphone. Um, that said, you know. Sometimes if the environment and the noise of it is something that adds to the, uh, to the experience or the content of the interview, it can add ambiance to, uh, to the situation and to the final resulting recording. Uh, my late colleague, Greg Sharrow, I'll refer to Greg a bunch today, uh, used to always keep an omnidirectional mic in his kit bag, uh, mostly in case he showed up at someone's house to do an interview and was surprised by the fact that they wanted to have their husband or wife sit in on it too. So he, they were useful for doing these group interviews compared to the directional mics he would normally use. Also, because of the physics of, of just how they function, they're better at rejecting wind noise, like that sound um, that you hear when the wind blows across the diaphragm and flusters it. Um, that's one reason why uh, when you see people on the news, like the talking head people standing out in the hurricanes or even you know doing on the street stuff, one of the reasons uh, they use omnidirectional mics is to take advantage of that reduced wind noise or that increased wind noise rejection. And one point I want to make too is that when we look at the shape of these microphones, often you can't tell the difference between say an omni mic and any kind of directional mic because they all kind of look the same. But these are two examples of, of, uh, field, of common omnidirectional mics that are used in field recording. So the next type of mic we're going to talk about is a kind of directional mic. There are a whole bunch of different types of mics that focus their polar patterns, their sensitivity in certain ways. And one of the most common we're going to talk about is, that we're going to talk about is the cardioid pickup pattern. And once again, you see that outer that circle, that circle represents kind of a 360 degree omni mic sensitivity. And inside of it, there's this thing that looks sort of like an upside down heart. Um, that's where we get the cardioid notion. So if I were to place a mic in there, you know, this is a sense of the sensitivity. Um, this primarily sensitive to the uh, front and to the sides. Let's go back to that heart there. Uh, really kind of, you know, I think one of the most common um, types of pickup patterns in general and uh, one of the most common employed in field work, I tend to work with cardioid pickup pattern mics more often than not when I'm doing interviews. They're pretty good for screening out extraneous noise. Not great because sound moves around, right? It bounces off of things. So it'll eventually get pointed at the front depending on the, the acoustics of the room. But uh, a solid workhorse kind of polar pattern. And you know, these are two examples of cardioid mics. Now, one of the clues to pick up pattern, if you look at the very bottom of this mic on the left, the Sennheiser MD46, you'll see a little drawing that looks like a cardioid pickup pattern, like I showed you there. That's a clue that that's a cardioid, that that's a directional mic with a cardioid pattern. Um, looking at the short, that's not there. And you wouldn't know that unless you happen to know it. Third, we're gonna talk about shotgun mics. And shotgun microphones are these long, skinny mics, often uh, used in video and film production. They have a sensitivity to the front and a little bit to the sides and back, but we really the, their value is their sensitivity to the front that's extremely focused, which is one reason why they're often used for film. You know, and if you see those guys walking around normally with the big poles and the thing on top pointing it in film production, the, inside that big blimp, they're called, uh, there are shotgun mics. And they could point them at the mouth of the individual speaker that they're tasked to follow and just pick up that person's voice. These are like super useful for screening out background noise. Um, I remember years ago we worked with a with a radio producer from Maine who came down and did a workshop for us and he played a recording uh, that he had made on a lobster boat and you can totally hear uh, the lobsterman talking clearly and you, you know he's on a boat because you still hear the rumble of the engines and other equipment in the background and we said how did you do this and he said oh you know I used the shotgun mic thing with shotgun mics is, unlike cardioids and omnis, you can't really place them in a stand because you have to keep them focused. So you need to listen to the recording while you're doing it and then keep the mic pointed at the mouth of the person you're interviewing. Because one slight turn of the head and that very narrow pickup pattern, they're out of it. And if they're out of it, 
then they're they're going to drop off and vanish from the sound from the sound recording. So um, it's important to remember that if you're using a shotgun mic, you have to wear headphones and have the mic either in your hand or in some sort of uh, shock-mounted grip so that you could keep it pointed at the speaker's mouth. And these are just two lower-cost common ones in field work. I use a Rode NT4G, uh, and it's just a variable name. Finally, we're going to talk about stereo recording and mics that are used for it, and in particular what are called single-point stereo mics. One mic uh, that, that has two separate capsules that records different, a different, uh, little bit different stuff in each side. Uh, the real utility of stereo mics is that uh, for music. So let's just say you're recording an acoustic ensemble that consists of a guitar player on the right, a bass player in the center, and a banjo player on the left. And if you point a stereo mic at them, the right side's gonna pick up more guitar and a little bass. The left side's gonna pick up banjo and a little bass, so that if you listen to that on headphones, you'll get in your ears somewhat of, a, of an approximation of the experience of that performance. So, you know, if you're trying to document a performance, stereo mics can be really great for that reason. Um, I'm just going to show you this again. This is, usually they use one kind of stereo um, mic placement, which is called XY, two overlapping capsules, to capture that left and right difference. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, they're terrific for that. The trick is if you're recording a space in stereo, you need to find like the sweet spot, they call it, the place in the room that sounds the way you want to sound so that you can capture the sound of the space, which includes the musical source. And these are just two uh, common field recording mics that are, that are stereo pickup patterns. Also, a lot of recorders with built-in mics do have stereo recording capabilities and use the same kind of array. Okay, John, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, sorry, my mic kept auto-muting for some reason. All right, so um, we've gone through the microphone, um, the insides of the digital audio field recorder, and now we're going to talk about sort of the, the outsides, what, what other things to think about with the device itself. So... Um, there's, we came up with three different categories to sort of think about the, the recorder or the device, the thing that's, you know, going, taking the audio signal from the microphone and turning it into a digital file. Um, there's the standalone digital audio recorder, which we saw a picture of one earlier on the, the Tascam. So it's a, a, a device that does one thing. Um, it records audio using built-in or external microphones, right? It has a mic, they have mic pre's and they have, um, you know, the AD converters inside, and but it, but it basically is designed to do that one thing. Um, past few years, there's also been a lot of interest in using cell phones, smartphones, or tablets to, um, to capture audio. And they, they can do that through apps. There's tons of different apps in both Android and iOS environments to record uncompressed audio. You get professional quality, audio, but you have to get the, the audio into it, right? So the built-in mic on your cell phone is not ideal, um, but there are ways to get external mics interfaced with a cell phone or a tablet, um, usually connected through the USB or the lightning port and Apple devices. Um, there's many, many options and combos available. Um, there's no easy recommendation to offer, but it's just something to know. Some people are very interested in that. Um, the, one of the downsides of that is that cell phones or tablets are designed to do a bunch of different things, right? So unlike a standalone audio recorder, you're asking your cell phone to, to do many things. Um, it's always important to remember to put it in airplane mode if you are going to use it to record audio, or you will most certainly get a messed up audio signal as it hits the network and you will not be happy. Um, the third category we've come up with is the computer-based interface. So using a laptop or in remote scenarios that we'll get to in a second, I'm using your desktop to actually record audio through for interviews. Um, this requires effectively some kind of interface to, again, get microphone signals or audio routed into a recorder um, recording option. So, so again, three ways to think about um, digital audio field recording um, using different kinds of devices. When navigating across these categories, um, there's also a set of considerations we've come up with. Um, thinking about 
the options for external mic connections is going to be key, right? If you have a nice mic already, or you bought one, or you're able to borrow one, it's most likely going to have an XLR jack on one end, on the mic end, um, and you're going to want to have an XLR cable to go into a device. And, and this is what an XLR cable looks like. That's a picture of one. So it's a professional quality grounded audio signal. It has a, a hot and a cold pole and then a ground pole. So it helps cancel out some of the interference that might um, seep into other audio signals. It's a professional connection. It's standard connection. Um, not the only way to connect the mic to things, but it is, it is a really good bet. So that might be a consideration for you when looking at what kind of recorder to, to, to pick up. Um, form factor and usability are also other considerations. Um, does it have menus where you have to go into a menu and scroll through a bunch of features to set to set a kind of standard setting that you rely on all the time? Or are there buttons on the side? And the uh, 48 volt phantom power is a good example. Some recorders, you can turn that on and off with a button on the side. Some you have to dig into a couple of menus to turn that on and off for either channel. And then size, you know, how big of a device do you want? How small of a device do you want? Um, the, your own tech capacity or comfort is something to consider. Know your zone is how we think about this. Um, how comfortable are you having a really complicated device? Do you just want something you can pull it out and hit record? You want to have something you have to kind of set up a little bit. Um, there might be a trade-off with some of the other features, but it's worth considering. Um, availability, can you buy, can you borrow? Do you have it already? Um, and then finally, the site for field work is a consideration. Um, environmental considerations, infrastructure, access to power. Are you going to be able to charge batteries? Are you going to be able to plug in? Um, you know, some really expensive field recorders are designed to go on, on site anywhere in the world from, from Antarctica to the Arctic Circle and everything in between. They're expensive. They're really well built. It's generally not made out of plastic. Um, but do you need that to do oral history interviewing? Right, so there's thinking about this. And then, and then again, the remote consideration um, that we're finding ourselves all in now, the situation, what kind of, what, where's your field work going to be taking place and what kind of technology mo is most appropriate for that when thinking about audio recording. Other features of the device itself, um, almost every audio recording device I've seen has some kind of level meter on it, some kind of way to visually read the level of the sound going into the device. Um, now, so your input, effectively. Uh, VU is a term commonly used, the volume unit meter. Um, level meters is also a common term, uh, recording level. So all, all different ways you can think about this. Uh, it's really important, and this is true of analog gear as well, So, but it's really important in digital to understand what's going on here with your, with your, your recording levels in your meter. Um, Zero or zero dB, sometimes called unity gain, is the point of clipping. Um, so you can see where the green signal turns to red. In some meters, there's a yellow in between. So we get the sort of green, yellow, slow down, red stop. Um, red is really bad in digital. Red was bad in analog, but it would distort and kind of come back and maybe offer some warmth. In digital, red means that you're going to get overmodulation and your signal is going to drop out. For a little while so you might actually lose something if you're going into the red in digital so it's it's important to recognize that digital is less forgiving than analog and know what your what your recording meter is telling you in that regard um many many audio recording digital audio recording devices include a circuit called a limiter sometimes again that's a switch on the outside sometimes it's buried in in, in, a, in a menu in in um, that you have to scroll through with a tiny little knob. Um, but knowing what the limiter does is important. The limiter prevents your recording from clipping. So it effectively puts a pad in between the, the microphone input and the microphone preamp usually um, that doesn't allow the signal to get too loud and go into the red. Um, it's different than automatic gain control, which tends to ride the levels and go up and down. Uh, not so ideal, but a limiter is, is, is useful to understand. And again, most devices will have one. Whether it's accessible on the outside of the device or buried in a menu you have to scroll through is something you'll need to learn. Monitoring can happen visually with your meters, but it also should happen with your ears. Um, monitoring your recording with headphones lets you know what your mic is ac actually picking up. Um, everyone's individual practice is, is you know, tied to their own preference when I'm doing field recording, especially with interviews. Um, 
I'll listen to the recording through through an earphone, one side of the headphones um, for the first couple minutes, and then probably put the headphones down and just check in every once in a while. I won't keep the headphones on, but it's a good idea to just periodically listen to what the mic is recording. Um, to use it in conjunction with the VU meters, and both Andy and I have been in situations where the headphones are telling us our recording, but we actually didn't hit record, and so we didn't know that we didn't see that there was nothing going on in the meters, or we see that the meters are active, and then you aren't listening on the headphones, so what you're not realizing is you're picking up the sound of the air conditioning compressor next, or the refrigerator next to you, or a bunch of white noise because there's some kind of bad cable. So use the two monitoring methods together, um, keeping in mind that with level meters, zero dB is not, you don't want to go past that in digital. Um, so use, use both of those features together in, in digital audio recording. So we're going to jump into a, another section here. We just want to review some things we've gone over. Um, ideally, record in standard uncompressed formats such as WAV. Again, ideally, when you can, as, as often as possible. Record at a minimum of 16-bit 44.1 mono for interviews. Um, you might have production needs that require a stereo file. Keep in mind that an hour of 16-bit 44.1 mono is going to be 300 megabytes. If it's stereo, it's 600 megabytes, so you double your file size with stereo, but sometimes it's needed. Um, whenever possible, use an external microphone. You have better mic placement opportunities. You have a little bit, you can separate the recorder from the sound source. Um, use your headphones and your recording level meter to be able to monitor what's going on. Um, we did say we'd give a nod to remote recording, and so we want to dip into that a little bit. I'll, um, Andy and I were asked to do this webinar well before um, the coronavirus outbreak and the COVID-19 sort of stay-at-home situation we're all experiencing. So we hadn't really designed this webinar to attend to that. Uh, it came out of uh, workshops we've done over the years. Um, but we, you know, it is important to, to get at this. If you were um, able to participate in the, the webinar that Thomas Grant Richardson ran last week, then you heard a little bit about the why of remote recording and why we want to maintain those relationships. We're going to offer a little bit about the how how to think about some of the technological op opportunities and options, um, and give you a little bit of information maybe about some of the some of the terminologies and concepts. Um, so a VOIP is an acronym that people have been hearing a lot lately, probably. Um, it stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. It's actually a set of protocols and technologies that have been developed over the past 25 years to allow us to get audio through an internet connection. So Zoom, Google Hangout, and Skype, and any other video conferencing platform you may have been using for professional or personal reason, reasons lately relies on VOIP technology. Um, it also adds video on top of that. Uh, platforms like Zencaster or Squadcast um, were initially designed to uh, allow podcast producers to record interviews with people who are not in the same room with them. Um, so that's voice only, uh, but it's still it's a VOIP technology. Um, so the telephone call effectively is happening over over um, internet connections and other, and other protocols. Um, so with, with either of these, uh, video or, or voice only, you know, you can, you can record directly onto your computer. You can also, through a range of cabling and interfaces, run that audio out to a higher quality recorder, possibly. Um, there's always a danger of recording audio or video to the hard drive in your computer that's also running your operating system and running a Zoom call. Um, you tax the, the capacity of the hardware to do that. So pulling audio externally from a, from a device is, is a good idea. Um, again, there's so many scenarios for how to do that that it's hard to give overarching guidelines other than knowing it's possible. And you can apply some of the knowledge we've, we've already gone over to do that. Um, another option that people have been ex exploring lately is uh, using your cell phone to conduct remote interviews. Um, and Thomas covered a, a few um, options for this, but uh, there's a couple links there, and again, these will be in the, um, if you get a hold of this uh, presentation afterwards, um, you'll be able to follow these links more easily. But uh, apps for in-phone call recording, um, meaning you're recording the call on your phone while you're talking, you're recording both sides of it. Uh, again, whether you use, if you use a Mac or a, an iOS device or an Android device, there's varying options in, in price ranges, in quality, um, too many to go over, but just those links are some recent overviews and reviews that I found. Um, there's also ways to get audio out of your phone 
if you want to run the call, but also record to an external digital audio recorder you already have. And that will usually require using some kind of eighth inch stereo out cable to some kind of XLR or other connector to run it into your device. Um, so just know that that's, that's possible. Um, there's a, some other, some other ways to think about rem remote recording scenarios that it can involve digital audio field recording. Um, asynchronous versus synchronous are terms that, that are useful in this, in this um, conceptual arena. Um, right now we're having a synchronous interaction, right? So we're in, in usually interviews or synchronous interactions in a field work scenario. And you're sitting with someone or with a few people and you're sharing the same time. Um, you're sharing the same space for sure, but you're sharing the same time. Asynchronous means it happens at different times. Um, so one way to think about doing asynchronous interviews is if, if, if a person you're interviewing has the capacity to record themselves, you might send them a set of questions via email that you've either written down or spoken into a recording and they respond to them and then you have an asynchronous interview. There's, another, there's a bunch of other ways to think about doing that as well. But in this scenario where, where we're currently experiencing it's good to know that there's multiple kind of modes for doing remote recording that, that draw on the technologies that we've been talking about. Um, what do I need versus what do I want? Um, we get this question all the time. What's the best digital audio recorder? Which one do I need to buy? There's no simple answer. It depends on what you need to do and what you want to do. If you need to do 96K 24-bit audio recording because you're working with a producer, then you need to have that capacity in your, in your um, recorder. If you want to learn how to use stuff, you want to use stuff you have, you want to spend money because you have money, then that's kind of more in the want category. So creating a balance between those, um, getting recommendations, ask a friend or field worker, consult a state folk life organization or your local oral historian, read reviews, um, there's so many how-to videos and video reviews out there about digital audio recorders. I'm continuously watching them and listening to them, even if I'm not in the market for something. A, because you can learn how the features are changing in a market that's driven by technology rather than our field worker desires. Um, you learn how to read a manual better if you watch a five-minute review about a feature. Um, there's also some balances that cover some of the things we've talked about. Um, what's necessary for your work versus what's sufficient. Um, XLR jacks might be necessary, so you need to make sure you have them, a particular bit depth and sampling rate. Um, does the gear you have in hand already do enough for your needs? Is it sufficient? Then why upgrade? Um, affordability and budget is a balance, what you have to spend versus what you can get a hold of. Um, the ease of use and the efficacy. Uh, I always recommend people try to get their hands on something before they buy it because it might not have the features you want. They might not be in the right place. Um, you might not be comfortable scrolling through a bunch of menus just to get an interview set up. So uh, think about that as you're, as you're looking at some of these. Um, a few other things that you need, I'm going to try to go through this quickly so Andy can talk about preservation. Um, remember the signal chain, right? So we need microphones. Sometimes you might need a wind or a pop screen. Um, you need cables, extra cables. Uh, a mic stand, whether it's a, a you know, folding one or a desktop one. Um, you always need good headphones. Any headphones will do, but good ones are more comfortable usually. Um, accessories for your recording media. You might need SD cards or compact flash cards. Um, just like having extra cassette tapes when we used to do that. You don't want to run out of media in the middle of your, of your interview. Um, you, you might need hard drives either to offload the stuff after the fact or to store it for for preservation purposes. You might need extra batteries and power, and you probably need some kind of bag or carrying case to put all this stuff in if, once we are able to go about, out and about again. Okay, can everybody hear me? John, can you hear me? I'll go with you since I can hear you. Um, yes, sir. All right, so <clears throat> one of the things that I think is real important um, is, oh, you can? We're good? Okay, good. Thank you, Faith. Um, one of the things that we think is really important to remember uh, is, is uh, potential uses of your recordings after the, you're done with them. 
uh, you know, one of the things that uh, ethnomusicologists, folklorists, and oral historians have in common is that, and particularly with oral historians, you know, the recordings we make were made to save. And to save a recording, um, you got to have a plan, especially in the digital world. In, you know, back in the past when we had cassettes, right, I'm going to just throw up some words while I'm talking so you don't just have to look at a white screen. You know, that cassette you recorded, you could stick it in a box under your bed and 20 years later, provided you don't move and the box is still there, you could pull it out, likely pop it into a cassette deck and play it back. Um, digital stuff is real different. Uh, and we say it's sort of fragile, uh, ephemeral. It requires human intervention to be sure that it's still accessible in the future. So digital preservation is really rooted around maintaining uh, both information, metadata about the uh, material and storage, how you're taking care of it over time. And finally, I'm gonna talk about this idea of help, uh, which I just boil down to something simple, which is ask an archivist. Uh, there are plenty of us out there who know this stuff and are really happy to talk to you. Um, so digital preservation, and I'll leave this up for a sec while I talk at you a bit, you know, is, is more than just actions. It's policies, it's decisions, and it's actions too. It's all these things to help make sure that this content you've created digitally can persist into the future and remain accessible over time. So when I break out digital preservation, I break it out into these four fundamentals. The idea of interoperability, before you even start creating digital content, think about the formats you're gonna create it in and pick formats that are uh, both standard and non-proprietary with the notion that they're likely to be supported more broadly over time. Documentation, and this is that idea of metadata, capturing information about both the content of the recordings you're creating as well as the recordings themselves. Uh, you know, uh, formats, all sorts of things. After you've created it, the idea of storing it, of redundancy, right? Keeping those files in more than one place uh, and backed up in different locations. And finally, this idea of migration, being prepared to change file formats before the format you're using is no longer easily readable, or to change hardware before it fall, before it starts to fail, or before the connectors that are used are no longer on the machine. I'm going to start by talking specifically about metadata. And, you know, it's a fancy pants word that I started hearing in library school that emerged out of computer science. But what really it means is data about data, or in my opinion, what, what librarians and archivists used to just call cataloging. Um, in other terms, it's the information about the files you've created and their content. Uh, one of the things that people like to do is create different types of categories of metadata. I'm going to talk about three that I think are most crucial to the ethnographic context. And to me, that's descriptive metadata, which is information about the content of your recordings. Administrative metadata, which in this case I'm describing as information about permissions and rights, access and use, uh, all that stuff that gets wrapped around the recording so you know who's allowed to use it, when it's allowed to be used, um, who owns the rights, all that other stuff. And finally, this idea of structural metadata. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that much at all, but because that's mostly gathered by the machines themselves. Uh, it's, it's what is the file, what's the structure of the file, all this other stuff about it. So we're really going to focus on this idea, these two ideas of descriptive and administrative metadata. You know, as the researcher, you need to decide what kind of metadata do you want to document and store? What are the questions you'd ask yourself to say, you know, what information is important to your institution or your research? and capture it. Um, what might be useful to other people down the road? You know, if that's a consideration of yours, it's something you should think into when you're pulling together, when you're thinking through the kinds of metadata you want to capture and preserve. And then finally, what information is necessary to even get at these files in the future? Um, so the idea is you record the metadata, but to record it, you've got to store it somewhere, right? So, you know, places you can store metadata are really fancy, complicated database systems, absolutely. Um, or in places like the file names and the file headers, in separate files like spreadsheets and text files, uh, transcripts and logs are another example of, of, of metadata storage uh, sites, and also in tangible form in physical documents, you know, 
creating a list and writing down a list of what everything is. Now, um, there's one of the handouts is a handout on file naming that was produced by AVPS, uh, a, a company that provides services to audio, sound, and video archives. And um, you know, one of the key things that we'd like to say in, in my business is that a file name is not a database, right? The file name is not the place where you write out everything about the person you've interviewed, where it is, the date, stuff like that. However, it is a place where you can record some information that'll help you um, It'll help you look at that file and have a sense of what it is. And I'll give you an example of one of the um, approaches that I like to present. Um, you know, there's a bit of a divide in how people talk about file naming. Um, you know, on the one side, people, some people feel that file names really should be arbitrary and referenced in an outside source like a database. Uh, I'm of the school that particularly in the realm of personal digital archiving, which is basically what we're talking about, people taking care of their own digital materials they've created, uh, a file name needs to have some human readability to be really helpful. So with a file name, this is just, you know, an example here for interview based file naming, uh, you know, and uh, the idea behind this little this setup here is that if you, you know, you've got the name of the person on the far left, which means in a, in a file, so most files is a little sort by S, um, you have a date, which makes it unique, right, because one of the things with file names is they need to be unique. And then descriptive information that'll help you know in case you lose or don't have access to, to visual access to the, uh, the extensions, what kind of file that is. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll just address quickly, too, is this idea of file headers. Um, in audio preservation, file headers are becoming increasingly useful for being able to enter information about the recording that lives with the recording. So uh, most of you are familiar with this, maybe without realizing it, uh, with MP3s. So, you know, if you play an MP3 on your car, uh, your car system or your phone, um, it'll usually list the name of the artist, the album title, the song title. All that stuff is metadata that's stored in the MP3 file header, which with an MP3 is called an ID3 tag. Waves, um, the broadcast wave format in particular, but waves, it's still a wave, have another header where you can put in all sorts of information, kind of like typing the label, writing the label on a cassette. Um, you know, and uh, there are different pieces of software for accessing that. We can, I can give you some advice about that later too. We don't really go into it in detail. So metadata is one part of what you need to think about when you're talking about preserving. Um, the other thing is file formats. You know, what are the file formats that are best for preservation? Um, a key thing we like, I like to point out is that, you know, in best practices for digital preservation, uncompressed file formats are what are recommended for long-term storage. The argument being that if you, you know, if you record an MP3, convert it to a wave for storage. By all means, keep the MP3 too. You know, it, it's great for use. They're smaller, easier to copy and pass around than a larger WAV file might be. And honestly, the same thing goes for JPEG files. Uh, if you're taking photographs that are part of your research and saving them as JPEGs, convert them to TIFFs for long-term storage uh, because TIFFs are uncompressed. So JPEG is, you know, JPEG in the audio world is basically an MP3 and uh, uh, TIFF in the image world is basically a wave in the audio. Um, data storage, and this is a tough one, because really the thing I recommend for people who are managing these things on their own is to think in terms of multiple external disk drives that are stored in different physical locations. Uh, you know, one of the things we do at the Vermont Folklife Center is we have a server on site uh, that, that contains the archive. One of the backup strategies we employ is to back it up to large external hard drives, and one set lives at my house, and one set stays in the office. The virtue of this is that if something goes wrong at the office, there's still the copy that's at my house. And if something goes wrong at my house, there's still the copy that's at the office, you know, uh, and just think creatively about how to how to find places for that. The other thing that's emerged, of course, is this idea of uh, cloud storage, right, of using online services that provide service storage as a way to diversify where you're keeping your materials to preserve them. And, you know, there's a list of them there, Dropbox, Google Drive, Bitcasa, Wasabi, you know, um, the challenge with these, of course, is that they're they could, they're expensive. And you have to depend on the fact that they'll both be mindful of your data and that they'll still be there uh, when you want to get at your data. Um, there are sort of archival specific services and stuff like that, but uh, they're a whole different kettle of fish for the individual researcher. My main piece of advice is just like back it. Be sure you back up everything and then back up your backups. That's kind of my, my approach. So document your metadata. Create things in stable in, uh, excuse me, in open non-proprietary file formats and store stuff uh, in multiple places.
the other point here is that check your files in media regularly. You know, if you've uh, got a hard drive and you plug it in and it start making it's making weird noises that you haven't heard it make before, maybe that's a clue that you should copy those files off of that drive and onto another one before the drive fails. Um, you know, uh, make sure that the connectors that are akin to your drive case, unless you're comfortable removing the physical drive from the case and putting it in a new one will match the ones that are on your computer because eventually these things start to change and the connectors that are easily available on computers now won't be available on these computers in five years necessarily. And then migrate, migrate, migrate. You know, just make sure that you take care, that you copy stuff off of old equipment before it's inaccessible. Change file names to, excuse me, change file formats to new file formats if the best practices change over time. Finally, get help. You know, archivists all over the country are usually very happy to help researchers with advice around this. You know, this is a little bit of a specialized area in archiving, um, audio and AV archiving. But you know, um, there are plenty of people who are affiliated both with OHA and AFS who are archivists. The Society of American Archivists has sections that are dedicated to oral history and to sound recordings. So there are plenty of people out here also. And the final thing I'd say is that you know. As you, as you, if you're contemplating your project, your research project, after you've finished it, and you think, and you have the permissions from your interviewees to be able to deposit it, reach out to repositories that you think might be interested in taking it. Because another way to ensure long-term preservation of your materials is to build a partnership with a repository whose job it'll be to take care of it. So you're not the only one managing it. Um, you know, one of the one of the phrases I picked up from my friend Kathy Kirst, uh, formerly of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, is you as the researcher are the first archivist of your materials. And ideally, there'll be other repositories down the road or another repository that will take over um, when you're not really into doing it anymore. So reach out, get help. Yeah, as Terry Jordan says, come see us at the Ask an Archivist table at AFS. Um, and, uh, you know, and get that help that you need that we're, many of us are really well happy to provide. Got the questions? Ask an archivist. Got, see, I got it in there, Terry. But anyway, that, that kind of wraps up um, where we're going with this. Oh, so I think we uh, can just uh, yeah, go into the queue. We can come back on camera, Andy. Thank you, everybody. So people can see we're both here. Okay. Um, all right. So, well, we went a little bit over our hour. Sorry about oh, that, God. folks. Um, so I was scrolling back through the chat. It looks like most of the questions were answered in the chat, although a few more. Oh, okay. Any recommendations for learning more about audio editing, editing and audio production? Um, Lynda.com is a, is a pretty nice resource, a video resource for, um, for tutorial videos on most things technology, but I know they have some rich audio stuff. Uh, oftentimes public libraries have free access to Lynda.com. I know the DC public library system does, and I believe the Montgomery County public library system does where I live. So I could, as a card carrying member of either of those systems, I could access lynda.com online through their portal. So it's worth looking into what your public library might offer. Um, universities sometimes offer access to lynda.com too. Um, and that's L-Y-N-D-A.com. Um, uh, I know I've, I've taken an audio recording course at a, a local um, recording studio. It was pretty inexpensive and I learned a ton about digital audio. I don't know, Andy, do you have other suggestions? Yeah, I mean, transom.org, which is a which is a website that's a resource for mostly radio producers, has some information on both on equipment reviews of recording equipment, but also um, also some guides and suggestions for editing and production. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. Also, the, like if you're going to Google it, podcast. Is uh, there's a question the about phantom moment, power. I don't want it to pass up as more things. questions coming. Uh, you know, you use phantom power when you're uh, using a see. condenser microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah I was, so the general practice yeah. is you plug everything in, XLR cable into your recorder, into the end of the microphone, and then you turn phantom power on. And then before you unplug everything, you turn phantom power off and unplug it all. If you turn phantom power on when you have a um, dynamic microphone, nothing bad will happen. Um, they just don't need it to operate. If you turn if you turn phantom power on with a ribbon microphone, though, something bad might happen. Um, so, but you won't be using ribbon microphones. So, the, the rule is with a condenser microphone, you you 
almost always need phantom power on unless of course it's an electric condenser which has a battery built into it but you will know that by reading the manual that came with the microphone or by googling for the manual of someone if you inherited it from someone but if there's a battery chamber in there you can, like the stereo microphone i have that i bought in 1998 you can put a little double a battery in there and then i don't need to use phantom power but if the battery dies i can turn phantom power on on my recorder and still use the microphone so you always need some kind of power source with a condenser microphone and it's always a good idea to turn phantom power off before you unplug everything and on after you plug everything in I'll, um, so Annie has a question about uh, giving copies of the digital interview to the uh, to the interviewee. Um, our practice at the Folk Life Center is that we generally ask at the time uh, how they might want it. Uh, you know, at this point, hoping that what they want is for me to upload it to a place like Google or Dropbox so they can download it. Um, we do still make CDs for people if that's their preference. Particularly older people are happy with that. Um, Thumb drives and and solid and secure digital cards have become so cheap that the other thing we do sometimes is just oh, there's buy a question and why audio and not and video. Um, I don't know. Andy and I both hate video. I guess uh, no. <laughs> um, no uh, re video um, entails yeah, that's a, a lot more complicated things to understand with regard to file formats for one thing and and the. the compression algorithms and the wrappers that go around all of them. It's also more complicated in terms of preservation because of that. Um, audio has a more straightforward signal path for my mental capacity. Um, I know a lot about audio for video, but uh, yeah, I mean, video is, is a great tool and using video in, in oral history and ethnographic context is wonderful. Um, if, if your project requires it, there are certainly resources to, to learn more about the video component. A lot of what we talked about, um, the audio stuff can apply to video scenarios. Like there is an audio signal chain when you're doing video. You can use external microphones and you still have to think about preamp. You have to think about sampling rates because digital audio can usually relies on a 48 kilohertz sampling rate. So if you're recording separate audio, you want to record it to 48, not 44.1, because then you'll have to convert it later. You have to transcode it. Um, but yeah, neither one of us really deal in, our, in video very much. Yeah, we yeah, didn't even no, want to be it's, on it's video. A bias on my part. Of course, this is an audio workshop, so I don't, you know. <laughs> uh, and Jessica and Chris said we have to be right? on video. Right, like here we are struggling to be, uh, to be on video. Um, uh, there was one question. Yeah, they did. Uh, there's one question that came up earlier during the session that I only partly answered about converting uh, stereo files to mono um, after you've done it. You know, my, my take as an archivist is I'd like to re I'd like to try to preserve the original version um, regardless of the format, and even if I derive a preservation version from it. Like if I record something in MP3, I generally save the MP3 and make the wave. Um, if it's in stereo and I want to make it mono, I'd likely keep the stereo too, unless space was an issue or uh, unless other circumstances. Because when we talk about stereo, we're talking about um, a recording that that has something different in each channel. It's a two-channel recording, and if you listen to it in headphones, it, what's on the right is slightly different than what's on the left. And to create that, you need to use a stereo microphone, some sort of stereo input. So if you've recorded uh, with a single mic, a mono microphone, and created a stereo file, you're not really creating a stereo file. You're creating what's called a dual-channel mono file. And in the case of a dual-channel mono file, what's on the right and what's on the left is identical. And if I want to create a mono file from it for whatever reason, I tend to copy one channel and create a whole new mono file from the contents of that one channel. Um, the other thing I do sometimes do is sometimes using, uh, there's some recorders that will only let you record in a stereo setting, even if you're just using one microphone. So when you look at it in an editor, you have one channel that is full of sound and the other thing that is just a flat line. You know, and in those cases, I will often remove, I'll split it and create a single file from that one live channel because there's no reason to create the, uh, no reason to save the stereo in my mind if it's just a blank line. Um, the trick is if you have a true stereo file that you want to convert to mono, and that's a processing issue. Um, and I think John can probably potentially speak to this uh, with more authority than I can. But you know, the way in which uh, digital audio systems create a single channel, a mono file, 
from a true stereo file is it basically does a lot of math. They sum it to create um, to create an approximation to create a mono version of what the stereo file contained. And sometimes, depending on the software and other factors, it can add a lot of noise into the system if it's done in certain ways. So that's just something to be mindful of. Uh, I no, I don't. Um, my daughter started practicing piano in the background, so I muted my microphone. Um, we'll be treated to my hold music. Um, no, no, I think you covered it perfectly fine. Um, uh, I, Ellie had a... <laughs> asked a question about affordable recorders for undergraduate use. Um, I know that Zoom recorders are usually ones that are worth the money you spend on them. Um, I mean, do you have any other recommendations, Annie, for, I know you had talked about a scenario that the Vermont Folklife Center was into. Yeah. It's Hotel California. It's a very complicated arrangement here. God, the hold music is awesome, John. Is that one of the kids playing the piano? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, it, in that, like what we balance at the Folklife Center when we purchased equipment for use in K-12 schools was we wanted something that would have an XLR connector in part because they're more durable uh, than usually the, the other option, which is a mini plug, a 3.5 millimeter plug. Um, two, they would also allow us to more easily use uh, professional mics with them, you know, and uh, that was our main focus, right? Like relatively easy to use, relatively cheap, has XLR uh, inputs. And we went with the Tascam, what is now the Tascam DR40X. Uh, it's not a great recorder, but it, it fit, the, fit the needs we had at the time. And as I said, those needs were primarily, well, the needs are primarily the ability to actually record in mono instead of create a mono sum file. And uh, the ability, and that it had XLR connect. Uh, but the zooms, you know, the zooms are comparably priced, and I think are probably. Um, it looks like Annie piece. has a question. It's a good one. Uh, the headphones sound loud enough, but the playback is too quiet. So um, it's really easy to have your 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 headphone amp circuit turned up loud, so you think it's a really nice signal, but your preamp or your recording levels are too low. So it's easy to get those confused for sure. Um, so what you want to do is make sure and again that's a way to like we said use your headphones and your levels to monitor it's easy to fool yourself if you're not aware of it by turning up the headphone volume you're not turning up the recording volume you're not returning up the input gain on the mic pre so um a good rule of thumb is to make sure that your incoming signal is peaking at around minus four db on your meter which could be in the yellow on some meters um in that example we showed it was in the green um with again zero being that where you don't want to go past. So you'll have to kind of do a little visual there and then make sure that you can use the headphone volume to make sure you're hearing okay. But that's not actually increasing the input signal. So it's gonna, depending on what recorder you're using, um, Annie, it's kind of hard to give exact recommendations because yeah, that relationship is, even though mechanically or electronically it's a one relationship, it, it occurs differently in different recorders because of how volume knobs are produced. Yeah, I mean, that's like my classic rookie error was doing exactly that. You know, that I was, I was dispatched early in my time at the Vermont Folklife Center to interview one of the first women to hike the Long Trail, which is the Vermont leg of the Appalachian Trail, and uh, sat down, plugged everything in, slapped on the headphones, was like, this sounds great. You know, everything sounded clear, did the whole recording, got back and put it into the cassette player and it was incredibly quiet. And it was incredibly quiet because I wasn't paying attention to the meter. Uh, you know, so the reminder we always give is that the head, what you're hearing out of the headphones, the volume you're hearing out of the headphones is adjusted by the volume you're using to raise or lower the headphones. And while that's relative to the input, it's not the same as the input. The input is independent of it and you're just rocking off of it one way or the other. Um, the other classic rookie mistake that John and I have both made is the uh, the magic of record pause mode. Um, with a lot of recorders, there's a mode called record pause where uh, it, everything is happening as if it's recording. You can check the levels and set them. You hear the sound from the mic in the headphones, um, but uh, you're not actually recording, right? And usually there's some sort Time of clue, right? The clue is, mm -hmm. you know, something's flashing or not flashing. I mean, it seems to be, but you know, and then you go on and start, yeah, time code's not going, thank you. And then you go on and do the whole recording. Um, 
you know, it, uh, and then you didn't record anything. So, you know, rule one is, hey, make sure you're watching the meters to make sure what you're, what you're hearing through the headphones represents the, the loudness that you're um, going to get. And yeah. two, hey, make sure those you're those not in record when you think you're recording. Um, okay, I want to get to Karen's question in a second, but Sally, um, you have a preamp in that scenario. Um, you always need a preamp when you're using any kind of microphone into a recorder. Um, the Zoom H6 has one. Um, you don't necessarily, it's not something you have to turn on or off, and it's not an external thing that you need. I mean, there are such things as external field recording preamps, but any recorder available right now is going to have one. If it has XLR jacks or any kind of mic input, an uh, eighth-inch stereo, um, it'll have a preamp in it. So you you have one, whether you're turning it on or using it is, is a different question. I mean, you know, you're going to be using it if you're getting any kind of audio signal. Um, so Karen's question is about how to get interviews from students' phones in an online class and to turn in his project. So they're going to need to get the interview off their phone, which um, there's no straightforward answer on that. There's any number of ways that happens. Usually mo many um, in-phone recording apps allow you to upload the phone, uh, upload the interview to Dropbox or, or Google Drive, and then they could email it to you from there. Um, sometimes you can... You know, plug it into a computer and offload it that way, and then they can. So there's different ways that they're going to be able to get those interviews off the phone as the recording device, and then into your hands. Um, file transfer is the what I was thinking of the term I was trying to think of. Um, and different apps have that built in. Again, it, it, there's no easy answer because the there's no standard way that app developers do that at this point. Um, which is frustrating and infuriating, but of course they're not thinking of people teaching online classes or folklorists or oral historians naming a quick and straightforward way to get audio off their phone. Um, it's always possible though. Um, let's see, Jen Brown has a complicated question about coastal environments with lots of salt water, humidity, and protecting gear or buying specific equipment that might do a better job. Um, Ziploc bags are really good. <laughs> um, they. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, my, Jen, my advice is like, yeah, just don't yes. get it wet. You know, like, I, this is, but, you know, I, I, condensers tend to be more sensitive. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, yeah, condenser microphones. Uh, condenser micro better. So that's one um, consideration, uh, John. Cases that seal, I think, you, or, you know, the, um, you talked about insulated lunch boxes earlier, Andy, as, uh, as gear, gear bags. I mean, there's, there's really expensive cases that have a built in water seal around them, um, the Pelican case series. Uh, that's great for protecting gear in general, but especially in extreme environments, hot, cold, humidity, saltwater, corrosive stuff. Um, so you just have to, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have any specific recommendations because it kind of depends on knowing um, both your budget and what you're hoping to protect. Like you want to protect it while you're using it or just while you're, you know, kind of in, you know, traveling to the environment or sitting in it. So it kind of depends. So uh, feel free to email either of us, and we can get some more some more specifics on that. Um, yeah, Nancy Solomon says always remember to turn yes. your microphone on. Yeah, always turn your microphone yeah, I have on, no especially. Yeah, I've run into that many times. It has a switch. Times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, further, what I mean by if it has a switch. Yeah. Go ahead, Andy. You take that one. Oh, hey, Virginia. So your question about. Yeah. Go, John. No, no. Okay. No, I was just going to say uh, that you know it. It depends. You know, some recorders actually they'll add noise with phantom power when it's unneeded with a dynamic microphone. Other times they don't. Um, you know, so in, in some ways it really doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know, and this is a question that anybody who does know, I, I would I would uh, appreciate you chiming in. Um, you know, whether having the phantom power on uh, when you're using a dynamic mic drains the battery faster. Uh, yeah, because I mean, I don't. Assume, yeah, I, assume I think it, would, it might. I don't actually, know. But um. Virginia, it's never a good idea to, to plug a microphone in when phantom power is already on. That's sort of a standard audio engineer answer. Phantom power should always be the last thing you turn on and the first thing you turn off before taking your system apart. Um, the danger is when you plug in a, usually this is with more expensive microphones, but if you plug a microphone into a hot cable, meaning there's power, there's power running into it, it could wreck the back plate of the, of the, of the, um, condenser setup because it, it might because when phantom power turns on it doesn't turn on all at once it, it ramps up slowly if you've ever um, had your headphones in and everything set up and then you turn the phantom power on 
You hear the signal start to get louder like this. That's because phantom power ramps up. It doesn't go on all at once like a light switch. So that's why the recommendation is to turn it on after everything's connected, turn it off before disconnecting everything. See, uh, M4A compared to MP3. Um, M4A is is a it's, quick it's time an, it's file. It's an Apple correct, proprietary. Well, I mean, it was proprietary at one point. I guess it still is. It's an Apple compressed audio format that they developed. MP3 was developed by a consortium of audio engineers and scientists. Um, M4A was developed by Apple to kind of try to corner the market in iTunes. Um, so it's basically a compressed audio format. Very few digital audio recorders will produce an M4A, except something in an Apple iPhone, probably. Yeah, yeah, that's it's sort of the default iPhone recording audio for audio. Uh, let me see. What's Do a landline? Do you have any problems recording from a landline? <laughs> I believe I saw them on the Flintstones. Uh, I've never actually, like the only time, I haven't used um, a, a land like a, like a phone tap uh, for a landline recorder in years, and when we did, I don't think we ever called anybody on cell phone, so I don't even. I know. guess this, this, yeah, the short answer is no. I've never that. encountered I'm problems, sorry, but Gary. that's a great question, right? Um, <laughs> I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> I suppose it would be. The, I suppose it could be any problem you would encounter with cell reception or a dirty landline. Um, I don't think that particular combination would create inherent problems. It's just any problem with recording a signal moving through the air is. Um, yes, Virginia, that's exactly why complicated menus on your device can be less than ideal. <laughs> and, and more and more devices are becoming menu driven because they're trying to cram more things into the, the smaller footprint of devices. And again, just the last thing we'll leave you with is, uh, <laughs> audio device manufacturers do not consult <laughs> or oral historians when they create a new device. <laughs> we do not drive the market. Unfortunately, I would love to, no. um, Hey, Faith, wait, Faith are we, they're going to get emailed the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint and the other stuff. Just a question. Yes. You're welcome, Andrew. Faith says that all, all registered recipient or attendees will get emailed the recording link and the PDF of our slide presentation. Um, so take care, everyone. It was awesome to have you. Yeah, be well. Be safe. Happy be May healthy. Day. Happy May Day, by the way. We can turn on.